Nightingale 2 is located in Fairfield on the railway line. It comprises of 20 apartments and three shop fronts on the, on the ground. Nightingale is a model of housing delivery. The model essentially tries to create essentially housing that is affordable, um, that has a high sustainability factor, um, and is designed as a home rather than as an investment product. With the project, one of the key drivers really was this idea of trying to create a vertical community. The open walkways creates an active and dynamic street interface. If you have connection between the levels through that open walkway, then you can see other people. You have a connection with the street as well, and you have a connection with nature, with the planting around the open walkways. Then you've immediately created somewhere where you're much more likely to stop and have a chat with your neighbour. In relation to community spaces, there's also, of course, the rooftop garden. And the rooftop garden has both a productive garden in it um, and also a barbecue, an outdoor fireplace and a space to eat. What we try and do with these sorts of spaces is to create outdoor rooms, pockets, um, so they can be enjoyed by more than one group that goes up there. We collect our rainwater and we use a um, heat pump for all our hot water. The building also has 20 kilowatts of uh, solar power on the roof. This can possibly be expanded in the future. One of the things we do in Nightingale projects generally is that we give the most amount of area we can to live in and we get rid of the laundry, for example, and put that into a shared laundry, so which is another incidental meeting space where you bump into your neighbours. So we're sitting in a one bedroom apartment. We get light from the north, so it gets lovely morning lights and then light throughout the day but we also get ventilation through the apartments, particularly um, in these apartments which are very well sealed but are not air conditioned. They can open up windows and get cross ventilation which is very important in the Melbourne context. When you first walk into the apartment, you walk across a coir mat, you're underneath a, a timber soffit ceiling and then you walk in across the threshold and you're greeted with recycled timber flooring, exposed concrete um, ceilings, um, and then a simple pallet for the joinery, which is essentially form ply. It has a nice texture to it, it's relatively inexpensive, um, and it comes pre-sealed. The living space is both a, a living room, lounge room and kitchen. It's a single bed apartment. The kitchen runs along the southern wall of the living room. It has to function both as a kitchen and as storage. It's essentially made out of the form ply, but there's a level of materiality to it that goes beyond that. So there's stone involved, um, there are brass fittings, there's a mirrored um, splashback which also helps to increase the size, the perception of the size of the room. We've got some of the cabinetry is open, some of it sits behind uh, cupboard doors, which then allows the, the occupants to, to personalise the space further rather than it just being a sheer wall. We try to maximise the available space and maximise the use of the available space. So one of the key things in this apartment is the, um, the window seat, um, which then enables the table to sit up next to it. All the windows are double glazed. Um, we have used a European system of tilt and turn windows and they provide a fantastic thermal break and thermal seal. Um, and likewise, the mechanism for the sliding doors out to the balcony is a, 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 a lift and slide, which again sits, that, sits the door down onto a, a gasket, um, which provides a great acoustic and thermal seal. The apartment has um, underfloor hydronic heating, which is sort of a lovely low temperature radiant heat. The bedroom sits on the southern side away from the railway line, so we've mitigated the sound as much as we can through the use of double glazing and doors which perform well acoustically. It has floor to ceiling um, cabinetry. Because we don't have suspended ceilings, we've got exposed ceilings, that means that we can take our joinery up all the way up to the ceiling which means there's a whole lot more storage space in there as well. The bathrooms, it's quite a, quite a dark palette with floor to ceiling charcoal tiles but we have included a little bit of detail around um, the sink and then there's the, the brass fittings that will pick up what is otherwise a pretty simple palette of materials. And then when you transition back from the bathroom back out to the living space it feels like it opens up into a lighter palette again. Although we need to be careful about where money is spent, we selectively, I guess, a level of richness into the detailing. 
So you'll notice on the way in that there's a threshold, a timber threshold that you walk across. There's a, a lead light at the front that sort of sensed the bespoke, that the hands have crafted the building. You obviously can't include these levels of expense everywhere, but you can include them at key moments and that makes all the difference. I think developments like Nunningar 2 are important because they start to show the development community what is possible and I guess they also start to show up the idea that not everyone necessarily wants two bathrooms, not everyone wants a laundry in their house. They're prepared to share some of this space if it gives them a larger living space, um, if it gives them something that's much more, that has much greater amenity to them generally um, and they're interested in living within a community and they're interested in living sustainably. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our Never Too Small channel by clicking on the logo and the notification bell to receive updates on our latest episode.